What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Dev Talks Podcast, where we talk about everything engineering and technology-wise with your host, Travian. And we're back here with another episode, and we have a bunch of great stuff to go over. A lot of news comes out every week, and I wish it was so much news that I could talk about so much stuff every day, but I think I've really gotten to the hang of making some of these shorter videos for you guys. So if you want to check out certain specific videos, please check out the shorter, cl the shorter clips and... Those shorter clips are going to contain everything that you guys want to most likely listen to. And um, they're very more specific and they're based on a certain topic that we covered in the podcast that week. So I'm trying to get them out and most likely they'll come out a week or two after the original podcast. It depends on the amount of topics I may have talked about because there are a lot and just getting into used to this whole thing. But I just want to say thank you guys for all tuning in. And one other thing I wanted to show is this. So I got a little shirt for my for the podcast. It was a gift. Uh, I have a shirt and this is the hoodie. And then um, it shows like the milestones for the subs and stuff and things. And as we grow, I will be adding stuff to the sleeves and hopefully... We just grow so I can have a top sleeve full of it. So thank you all for all of that. I got this gift for my birthday. I really appreciate it. And I was like, why not? This will be the first episode I have it. So I'm going to wear it during this episode. And it's dope. It's it's dope. It's, it's nice to have my logo everywhere. I can wear this out wherever I want to and stuff like that. But um, just like, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Let's tune into this episode because we have a good one coming up. And let's really figure out what's going on. All right. So as I said, there's a lot to really go over this week. And just like every other week, we have a bunch of topics and things. Uh, this episode, I wouldn't guess overall topics is about four or five. Uh, big ones. It depends on how long it takes to get through all of this stuff because I really want to keep each episode that comes out around an hour long maximum. And then anything that doesn't fit in, it fits into the next episode for that. But this week we have a lot of news has been going on for Tesla. Tesla, hmm. I'm trying to like explain this in the best way possible for you guys. If you haven't noticed, Tesla's kind of been on a downturn. Yes, they just came out with the Cybertruck. Yes, they just like had a bunch of recent news and a lot of people are like, oh, they're a tech company. They're more than cars. And we've been recently, it hasn't been anything good. We first had the news that came out with BYD taking over the world over Tesla. Tesla's not getting those opportunities. And then the Cybertruck, how often are we seeing? We're still not seeing them out in the roads. And the first ones came out a few months ago. And that's very specific. You have to be like around the warehouse i believe people are driving them like houston and other places um so there's that and then also the stock prices for tesla has been going down like a bunch so a lot of news recently has been coming around in the past week about their whole downfall and the turmoil around them so we got to get into this because they're really struggling and one of the things that i want to focus on this week is are they truly a tech company or are they just a car company that has a little bit of tech stuff within them. And we're going to be able to, by the end of this video, I think we're going to be able to really divide, define that and define what this belief may be and whatnot. So we have this first one and we've been talking about layoffs crazy lately. And now it seems the news are thinking that they are going to be doing some layoffs as well too. So let's just dive in into this episode. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe for the algorithm. It helps out a lot. I really appreciate it. And let's see what they got to say. So what we kind of heard from sources is it's performance review week. And managers are saying or being asked to look at everyone that works or reports into them and decide, I guess, who stays and who goes. Well, that's that's the fear. I mean, we don't know that for sure. But what what we've heard, I mean, I think you and I have heard from different people is that um, performance evaluations happened. And then what I heard was that they were reopened. And there was one new question. Is this employee's role critical? 
And that's like basically you need to just, and then the managers need to justify that job. So that is definitely worrying. You know, Tesla so far has avoided the layoffs that have rocked Silicon Valley. We don't know whether this is sort of a culling based on performance or whether widespread layoffs are in the, in the offering. What I would reflect on is that this is kind of normal, both in the sense that Tesla's looking for cost savings everywhere, but it's kind of played out in the past. And I know that, that I've heard from sources, like, for example, when we reported on the autopilot trims last year, that headcount was moved elsewhere to, like, batteries, for example. Um, what, what is the aim here from Elon Musk and Co., do you think? Well, I think that, you know, Tesla is still aggressively hiring in a lot of areas. If you look at their website, they have tons of openings for Optimus, for Dojo, for Megapack, um, for, you know, payment systems. I mean, there's a lot of job openings at Tesla, so they are still aggressively hiring. So this could be an effort to just kind of reduce headcount in some places where they feel like it's no longer necessary so that they can afford to hire elsewhere. And Anna like say a goldman sachs they're trying to put forward the idea before they dive in further in this one thing i want to say this is very familiar to what we heard last week uh when it came to like google and microsoft and their layoff stuff they micro especially microsoft they were looking for and even google they were looking for people internally that they can move to other situations and they were also getting rid of what they no longer needed what they weren't focusing on um, all the other things that were coming across that they wanted to invest more in. They're hiring more over here versus over there. And what kind of positions are these? And as software engineers, we really have to think about what positions we want to stay in and where we want to develop our skills around because it's very important. And it seems now, in a sense, man managers in some sense are going to become a little bit more valuable because they're having a lot more pull and control based on what they said on the reviews. Is this person more about, is this position critical? How valuable is this position? And things like that. And what we're basically going to be experiencing and whatnot. So I find that very interesting that it, it's, I'm really wonder what's going to happen when it comes to that, because I haven't, been able to really experience that and go through um, a bunch of review stuff all the time and things but as far as like Tesla goes this this is something that we so far have seen is a very s similar scenario that we've seen in all these other companies thus far and it's going to continue I feel like we're going to be seeing stuff like this all year long as these companies try to figure out what's important and what do they need more and like how are we going to make the most money out of these sections so let's just continue off that idea that you'll constantly be reviewed if you're underperforming you might well be let go and I guess this is a way of ascertaining whether you are or not and I just wonder how it speaks though to the fact that we are seeing such pressure on Tesla from an EV demand perspective Will it automatically be in the manufacturing areas that you think these jobs ultimately have to be sacrificed? It's hard to say where the cuts, if they happen, would be. I mean, but I think that you're right. Like Tesla regularly, you know, they go through a performance review cycle every six months. And, you know, in Silicon Valley, it's called stack ranking or ranking yank to be coarse about it. And I think that just this just really keeps everybody on their toes. You always want to be a high performer. Uh, there's always concern if you if you're needing to justify staff. Um, I mean, I think that Tesla has grown dramatically since 2020 during the pandemic. They now have over 140,000 employees globally, and they will continue to hire in the areas of the company that Elon Musk really wants to sort of staff up. But like any company, you know, when you're kind of facing a down year in terms of growth, you start cutting and salaries is the way to do that. And Musk talked about the rate environment again when we played our earnings bingo, which I thoroughly enjoyed. That, I always find that astonishing, 140,000 people. If there's a big bright spot, it's probably the energy business because what they said was it will just outpace the, the car business in terms of growth. What else do we know about what's going on with energy? Yeah, so Tesla has this big... So, hold on. Is 140,000 people a lot? I mean, I know it's big. Oh, dang, I got rid of um, my next video that I was about to pull up. I know 140,000 is a big company. And... But how does it compare to the other stock companies in the mag 
in the Magnificent Seven, I wonder, because that's very important. That is very important. How Tesla compares to them, uh, especially nationally. So, oh, wait, number of not companies, employees. As I said, so that, yeah, it's, it's that's big. Like, if we go back here. Microsoft has about 238,000. Alphabet, Google only has 180. So Tesla is a big comp. It's huge, um, especially for how that they've been growing fast and probably faster than these other companies. I know Alphabet and Microsoft both did layoffs recently, but... That is that means they're growing very fast compared to the other people in their competition group as far as all the other tech companies. If you want to count them as competition, even though they're a car business mainly, I feel I still feel they're a car business, but they do have a tech aspect to them. So that's how I personally feel. But I think they're growing very fast. And one thing that could be scary and one that reason to predict these layoffs in um prematurely is you look at what their competitors just did. Google or Alphabet and Microsoft, they all just did layoffs recently. And they're around the same range as well as far as employees sake and stuff. And for Tesla to be newer than these companies and have the growth that it has and have the number of employees that it's at right now and the way that they're trending downwards, there most likely will be some cuts. And we that cut actually happens, we will review it and it will be I told you so and stuff. But I can definitely see them doing some cuts later this year, um, especially after Q1 is finished and they release the Q1 numbers and things like that. So that's, it. that's very interesting. Uh, I didn't know how big that was comparatively to some of the other companies, but they, they are right there with them as far as employee numbers and employee count. Big factory in Lathrop, which is here in California. It's sort of a little bit outside of the Bay Area and what we call the Central Valley, and that is where they are building the Megapacks. We also have heard that they are expanding Megapack production in Shanghai, and these are the big batteries that Tesla sells to utilities like PG&E, and it is a huge growth driver for the energy business. Like, Forget about the solar roof. Megapack is the, is the big driver of the growth there. Yeah, so that's just part one. We also have, so I, I guess they were adding to the end about the whole energy business on the batteries that they give out. See, Tesla does, they do more than just giving out their cars. And I believe they make a lot of their stuff in-house, but they still get parts from elsewhere. So I guess we're going to try to figure out how much they get revenue wise from each part. If this doesn't show that, um, because what this is going to do basically is compare Tesla to all its other competitors. So we say we have Apple, Amazon. Uh, I believe this is going to be talk about some alphabet in this, which is Google and things. And it's basically how their performance is going stock wise so that we can see if these this is really a problem or an issue compared to their competitors and how they're trending and how what ways can Elon possibly fix this. Uh, just like how we tried to make Twitter more possible. One thing that I think Tesla is struggling from is that whole Twitter X business. Elon got so distracted trying to bring that stuff up. He's wearing multiple hats right now. And that's becoming an issue for him because he has Starlink going on, Tesla, SpaceX, um, between getting all that new stuff up, and X. And he tried to, he lost so much money off of X or Twitter, however you want to refer it to it. And he's trying to recoup all that and things. And now one of his prized jewels is trending the wrong way. So we're going to figure more on that as well, too of seven big tech stocks, known as the Magnificent Seven, grew 75% in 2023, leaving the rest of the S&P 500 
in the dust. But if we look at each individual stock in 2024, the group has an outlier. Tesla has kind of stuck out like a sore thumb in terms of the has an outlier. Are Tesla they going to show? How are they not going to show all these other companies here? That's so messed up. What if I want to know what company this is out of Magnificent Seven? All these other companies. Oh, it looks like they all started off kind of bad. And then, yeah, they're all picking up. But I want to know what company this is having 30% growth already. And it's just saying this is Tesla. So did we take their word for it? We're going to look, we're going to look at this in a minute has kind of stuck out like a sore thumb in terms of the Magnificent Seven. This year, Tesla's share price is down more than 25%. If Tesla stock keeps falling, that might be bad news for the S&P 500 simply because it would drag the index down. Here's what Tesla's slide says about this elite group of tech stocks and why investors are concerned. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Nvidia, Alphabet, Tesla, Meta. The Magnificent Seven. This Unlike these gunslingers, movie. this Magnificent Seven is, by some measures, worth more than all the stocks from these four countries combined. But that dominance has bred doubt. So one big risk I think on investors' minds is that while these stocks have helped drive the market higher toward repeated highs to start 2024, there is concern that they could stage a big U-turn. And it wouldn't be the first time. In 2022, they collectively lost $4.7 trillion in value amid worries that rising interest rates could cause a recession, dragging down the rest of the index. People were thinking, has the dot-com bubble just burst? Uh, you know, are these stocks done for good? But in May 2023, that changed when NVIDIA announced record profits for an unexpected reason. Generative AI throws significant upside in demand for our products, creating opportunities and broad-based global growth across our markets. Many investors. So I bet you the main reason Tesla, all those other companies in the Magnificent Seven, they just listed out. Hold on. Where are we at right now? We're about 153. Uh, let's, let's get the chart back up. So Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, NVIDIA, Alphabet, Tesla, Meta. Meta, Alphabet, Amazon, and Microsoft, all part of AI. NVIDIA, part of AI. And correct me if I'm not wrong. Apple, Apple's been working on their, had a new product release and stuff. Tesla did too with their Cybertruck, but their Cybertruck's been lingering forever. It's been lingering forever, literally. But as far as Apple, I think they're working on some AI stuff too to integrate Siri that we're gonna supposed to we're supposed to see their new AI stuff later this year in their event. Um, normally around the spring, I believe that's when they had it last year. But Tesla, I haven't heard anything as far as AI updates and things like that how they're incorporating AI in their cars, how they're dealing with all that kind of news. I haven't heard much of that as far as Tesla. I did hear one news where AMD was going to put some of their new chips in Tesla's EVs, but it didn't exactly say AI. It said more stuff around for EV vehicles. So I, I think that's part of the reason why right there. That, that could be a big part investors looking at its earnings hearing its earnings calls like their mouths were to the floor they just had this incredibly blockbuster earnings report that shocked investors and made investors think we have to bet big on ai and that sent nvidia shares soaring and a lot of these other stocks soaring as well around the same time strong economic data and easing inflation gave tech stocks another boost that led to the magnificent sevens 75 percent rally but for Tesla, which was gearing up for the Cybertruck launch, there was a rough road ahead. You have Elon Musk saying, You know, I just want to temper expectations for Cybertruck. And that hit its stock pretty hard. Musk later revealed that Tesla fell behind Chinese EV maker BYD in quarterly sales for the first time. All of this helped lead to that drop in its share value. In terms of concerns about
That is something you cannot do. I get you have to be cautious. One of the things that a lot of companies do is they might oversell. And some people might even say this about the Vision Pro, that when the Pro was released and they had ideas on what they wanted it to do, all of those functionalities are not possible and are not great. So he was talking about for the Cybertruck, hold on now. Like Apple didn't go ahead and do that with the Vision Pro. They they letting people buy them like hotcakes. They're letting them buy the Vision Pros just out there and figuring it out themselves and other people can do it. But when the CEO comes out himself and says, I want to temper your, your thoughts on this, I can see how people can get nervous about that. Plus, BYD has been turning up on them. And we covered that video. If you haven't checked that video out, go check it out. Um, it's in the playlist for past episodes, and there's even a shorter clip on it. That's done very great. It's one of my popular videos. So go check that out. But that is one thing you cannot do. You have to stay prepared, especially for how much time they were working on the, the Cybertruck and all. Come on, man. Like, let's be serious now. Oh, you know, bubbles or stock being in a bubble. Tesla is the one that people <laughs> worry about the most. A bubble is when shares of a stock are pumped higher than they're worth often driven by investor excitement. Tesla has always been valued like a technology company, so that gives it a higher valuation because investors tend to value tech companies higher than they do, say, car companies. So some of the really bearish investors on Tesla say, hey, this is just a car company. This is not a tech company and doesn't deserve this kind of rich valuation premium. But there may be bubbles within the technology sphere, too. I've heard investors say that they think um, AI in the stock market and the impact of AI and all these AI beneficiaries are a huge bubble. Um, the issue is that we're still in early innings of the AI game in the stock market, and it's going to be years before we find out, you know, what are the implications of AI? How are people and companies actually using this technology? So that seems pretty far out in the future right now. While some investors are uncertain about the Magnificent Seven's future, Others are doubling down on their positions. Some individual investors and even institutional investors I've been speaking with are kind of afraid to bet against these stocks because they've been so dominant in the market. Some investors say that Tesla doesn't deserve to be part of that group, but. The thing is, people have been saying that Tesla is in a bubble for like five years now. Of course, for the most part, it's, it's held up the past few years. So time will tell if it ends up kind of collapsing and being the bubble that a lot of investors say it is. Yeah, so as you see, Tesla may, may not be going through it. And especially compared to all their other competitors and things, I, I really don't think they are a full-fledged car company and this they just got a lot going on they and when you listen to the other ceos and how they talk about their companies their companies are doing a lot they're a lot more purposeful i i don't hear i don't really hear too much as far as elon bringing too much excitement right now He's been a little bit all over the place. Uh, he's like one of the only CEOs I follow on Twitter, but that should definitely change uh, for sure because he's like his own marketing person and things. He just goes out and says stuff. Uh, Tesla shows me updates about certain things, and I've covered certain news around Tesla that I believe was bad and it was trending downhill. And they're just going to continue to fall. Then that's all they're going to do. It's just going to continue to go downhill. It's not going to work. And... It's not looking the best for them. There's, they have a lot of promise. I believe if they switched more into that car sphere, it would be a lot safer for them. And they would definitely seem a lot more dominant based on a lot of the extra stuff that they do compared to like General Motors and all of those other car companies. But that is something that they can, they're definitely on the winds about and something that we should see how they're going to turn out by the end of the year. Uh, it's, as I said, it's not looking good. And one of the other causes you can tell by if a layoff is coming is how much a stock is dropping of a company. If that one is dropping significantly a lot, they're going to make some cuts or they're going to make some big changes very soon. So as I said, they already dropped 25% and 
you guys are going to see it. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I caught it here, recording this on February 14th, Valentine's Day and stuff. So as a, it, it's going to reach that certain point eventually. If you don't think so, then let me know. And then one thing that I really want to know from you guys, do you agree with them being a technology company or would you say they're a car company? Which one would you say Tesla is? I don't know. I'm like, you really got to weigh it. Most of their profits comes from selling vehicles that more than any other thing. They do have some cool stuff. Like I saw their solar panels, especially for the housing and roofs. Wonderful. So they do have, they have good things that I'm actually very interested in. It's a company I don't think is going to go under or do bad um, in the long term. But right now they are having some pains and they might be some growing pains, but I think we're definitely going to be able to figure it out some more as time goes on. Something that we're going to be able to hear more from a CEO though, because I, I guess we might be able to see something from Elon eventually, maybe in another episode about what troubles we're going he's going through right now but google's rolling out a bunch of stuff and i believe he even talks about more other things so let's actually let's actually i'm gonna do this instead we're gonna hear from his mouth first so Alphabet CEO was recently interviewed and it was a pretty good interview. I, I listened to it already to an extent. Uh, this is me actually going to be reacting to certain things he says. And then also we covered in a previous event about Gemini, uh, Google basically changing Bard's name to Gemini and we have some more news around that. So this is a whole nother section for Google and the whole interview and all of that. Uh, so let's just see how he's imagining and what he's thinking about this whole layoff process and things. It Google's been going through layoffs this year too. We've dis we discussed that um, in length and length what positions they are uh, between what their focusing is and stuff like that. So Sundar Pichai, uh, he's gonna talk about some of the layoff stuff. As a um, actual CEO, I quite like him. I, I cannot say that for many uh, because I just haven't heard too many of them talk really. But him as a CEO, I, I quite like him. I think he's doing a better job than Elon is as being a CEO of a company. And we're gonna listen to this and hear out why. I want to talk about TV and sports for a second, just because the Super Bowl is coming up and there was a big deal uh, that was made uh, this week uh, in the sports TV world. Uh, you've been running YouTube TV quite successfully. And of course, YouTube itself is now bigger than Netflix, um, a fact that I think most people don't focus on. What do you. Netflix is so hyped. That you have to remember where YouTube came from. YouTube is so global. Netflix is global too. But as far as users, I I never believed Netflix had more users than uh, YouTube does. Mind you, it's also easier because YouTube is free. He didn't say YouTube TV has more than Netflix. He just said YouTube as a whole. YouTube is free. You don't need a subscription for all of that. So it brings a lot more people to it. Um, their platform and stuff. If Netflix was free, they would have a lot more users, of course, and things. But... They have a different model, but them having this many users on their platform could potentially lead to their growth of YouTube TV equating to Netflix one day. That's a hot take. Clip it and post it because I'm telling you it's a possibility that that might actually happen. But let's hear more. What do you think is going to happen to the, to the cable bundle? You've been part of sort of keeping that bundle through YouTube TV. What do you think about this new bundle that 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 um, that Disney is creating with with Warner Brothers Discovery and Fox? First of all, I mean, these are uh, some of our important valued partners, both on YouTube and YouTube TV, and I expect our partnerships to continue. Look, I think people are responding to how users are consuming all of this, right? And users are voting with their feet. 
the consumption patterns are clearly evolving. And I think, I think you're seeing people adapt to that. Uh, so I'm excited to see what they put together. These are great organizations, and they are some of our valued partners too. As you said, YouTube TV has now over 8 million subscribers, and you know we, the work we have done with NFL on Sunday Ticket has been super. I want to see something real quick. Sorry, he's not fully finishing. How much is a YouTube TV subscription? Because there's no way that's true. There's there's no way that's true. That yeah, that's more than the okay, so it <laughs> Google's saying it's seventy three dollars per month for first time customers it could be 63 per month for three months but that's for up to six households it says like right down here for youtube tv it says six household accounts memberships include national and local news networks so it, it's including all the tv stuff on demand movies uh i can see that actually now i can definitely see that because basically what they're doing is taking away cable and incorporating cable into youtube so they they are running numbers and one of the reasons I looked that up and I stopped it there is because $73 times how many um eight partners million? too as you said YouTube TV has now over 8 million subscribers 8 million subscribers is a little over half a million dollars and i wanted to i wanted to stop there so that we can really look at the scale of how much money these companies are really bringing in like this one decision is bringing in over a half a billion dollars 584 million dollars off of 8 million subscribers on a 73 dollar oh that's how much they're bringing in a month subscribed that's how much they bring it in a month half a billion dollars a month off of subscriptions alone and netflix since we gonna compare we gonna we gonna do some comparing because they brought up netflix in their own words what's the average netflix subscription Um, have to find like the average like the standard plan is about sixteen dollars how many subscriptions subscriptions does Netflix have two hundred and sixty million Dang. So in a month, YouTube TV is bringing in billions of dollars, billions, billions, half a million dollars, half, half a billion dollars, over half a billion dollars off of subscription bases alone. Netflix, if we just take their standard plan, mind you, I just subscribed recently. Because I was saving some money somewhere. You know, I just got my Netflix subscription. I'm a little hype about it. I've been getting my money's worth. Trust me. get my I get my money's worth from these shows. So downtime comes, it happens. So 16, instead of 8 million users, they have 260 million. And yeah. Yeah. Netflix is up. Netflix is um, making it some real money. I'm telling you right now, they are making it. Well, off that one plan alone, a month, just want to make sure I'm reading this.
four billion dollars. Netflix breaking in money like that? YouTube TV breaking in seven billion a year. Netflix is bringing in four, over half of that in a month. And that's just taking this, using a standard plan. It's not exactly accurate. Mind you, that's not exactly accurate uh, based off subscriptions alone. But because everybody has different sub subscription plans for Netflix, they have a bunch of different plans around it all. But it's money. And, you know, they make some money out there. You now we the work we have done with NFL on Sunday ticket has been super well received, and you know I'm excited for the Super Bowl as well. So, do, do you see yourself becoming a major bidder over time for sports? I think it's a great question. I think we will be ROI focused. So I think the answer it depends. Uh, for us, the NFL Sunday ticket gives us a great way to work with a very very good partner with very valuable content and 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 see how it works so far it's been great but i think we will have a, a disciplined roi framework we now have subscription products we have advertising products some of this pulls through demand on the our advertising products as well so i think we'll evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis right and this is why google goes through the changes they go through Especially you hear the terminologies used in ROI, return on investment. That's, that's how he's basing everything off of. That's how certain people are losing certain jobs. And that's how they're moving the layoff stuff. I, I believe they're going to get into the layoffs very shortly. But it depends on the return. And they're making these choices based off the return. What are they getting out of it? It's good that for them to be able to grow to not hang on to something if it's not returning them what they need. So they make these subscription packages the way they are so that people can watch the sports games on YouTube and stuff and it can bring more users onto their platform as a whole. So they have more users on their platform as a whole already than Netflix. Only a certain amount of them, percentage of them, are only subscribed to YouTube TV, but there's trying to the only way that return on investment keeps continuing and growing is more of those users on their platform move off of their cable and other streaming stuff onto youtube and tv and pay that premium price of 73 dollars i don't know if i'm getting it but it's quite expensive uh culture question uh you've been going through a number of layoffs uh those of us who try to keep up with the company from the outside have been reading articles about some of the all hands meetings and frustration that you're hearing from employees and the like. What's happening inside the company right now? Look, first of all, I mean, we see an extraordinary opportunity ahead, uh, given, given the shifts underway, and we are investing for that future. But I think it's important uh, we are able to create capacity with, from within. And so some of it is refocusing and reprioritizing within the company. Uh, making sure we can make the investments we need. And we are really focused on improving velocity and execution as a company as well. You know, when it impacts people, it's hard, particularly for a company like Google, which over the past 25 years hasn't gone through a moment like this. But, you know, we've always deeply cared about our employees. I, I don't think most companies engage with employees in the transparent way we do. And I think that that, that creates some of this conversation outside, but I've always viewed it as a source of strength for the company. And, you know, we'll work through this moment. And, uh, you know, I'm excited about the opportunities we have ahead and the innovation we have ahead of us. What do you think Google looks like? And I really like that. I One of the important, important, and I, when I put important on this, I mean a million explanation marks all over the point, everywhere. The biggest thing to look at a company is their culture and how they deal with situations like this. So if the CEO is sitting there, hey, I'm gonna move the people I need to move to keep their jobs and grow with and within so that their careers can grow within here. They have, they're already a culture fit. 
you're the best culture fit. I'm going to keep the best culture fit people in the company. And this is what we're looking for. You need to ha stick to this kind of culture. And this culture goes for every, every company has a different type of culture. Analysts have different culture. All these companies have different cultures. But as a software engineer, your biggest focus on staying at a company is your culture fit. Because that's going to keep you working at a certain level and your happiness at a certain level. But the culture is. And it is. I'm just telling you. That's that's the thing that's going to keep you happy and up there. That culture fit, I'm telling you, it is so important. It is one of the most important things it is. And the way he answers this question is so is very professional as well, too. It needs a lot, like... A lot of other people, and he, he kind of took a shot at other companies. He said, other companies don't do it like we do it here. And that's kind of the shot that I took from him. He said that we don't do it like that. We don't do it like that. <laughs> and that's amazing. That is literally great. It's amazing. And that's something that you want to work around and what you want to work for. If you are an engineer or anybody in, that wants to work in tech, these are things that you have to look for. Don't always look for the check. Mind you, Google is still kind of hard to get into for positions and things like that. And they have certain types of expectations and things. But the biggest thing that you really want to focus on is the whole culture aspect of this tech world and how you're going to be working. In any company, you want to know work in a place that has that culture fit for you. And... I just can't stress that point enough. So, Opportunities we have ahead and the innovation we have ahead of us. What do you think Google looks like in five years from now? Look, I think, uh, I think part of what excites me as a company is for the first time we are working on, we've always been a deep technology focused company at a foundation, but with Gemini and AI, it's the same technology which impacts search, YouTube, cloud, Waymo, and so on. So we can invest in this underlying technology and build both amazing products and businesses on top in a leveraged way. And, and we are investing for that future. So I'm excited about what's ahead. And if anything, I think it'll be a golden decade of innovation ahead at Google. And that's how they're going to do it. <laughs> and one of the best things that... Google is going to be able to take from that whole thing. They just said basically their AI surface and why they're focusing so much on Gemini, which used to be Bard, is the next five years, that's their focus. So if you're in school right now and you about to graduate and you want to know where it's going to be safe, it's AI. AI is the safest thing right now if you want to be an engineer and if you want a company Learning your skills around that kind of stuff is what you want to do. He just said it out of his mouth deliberately, uh, probably undeliberately, that AI is where you guys want to focus on. And that's the goal of the company for the next five years. And one of the main reasons is because it's going to help everything that they have already. In, all the infrastructure they already have, it's going to improve it. It's going, it's going to improve the infrastructure they already have and they can build more on top of it. And being able to scale at that rate is a wonderful thing for a company, especially tech companies. And you're going to see be able to leverage it more. People do it as content creators. People are going to do it as a bunch of other reasonings and stuff. I, I leverage AI in this podcast and all of that kind of nonsense. So I'm telling you. It's going to make such a huge, huge difference. You guys won't even notice it. And speaking of that, they also, the news a few days ago, co is covers a little bit of this AI. We did cover this during the announcement, but now the news is getting old a bit. So it pays to be ahead of the news. It literally does because now they're going to talk a little bit about it as well, too. Rolled out the full version of its next generation AI chatbot called Gemini. It gives users the ability to have conversations with the tech giant's most popular AI model to date. Early previews find some users are impressed while others are not so sure. So for more on this, I want to bring in uh, Gizmodo reporter Maxwell 
Zeff. Thanks for joining us, Maxwell. So is Gemini the, uh, the chat GPT killer that they promised? I, I read some reviews that suggested that perhaps uh, Google rolled it out a little prematurely because there was a lot of pressure to get something out there. Right, Anne-Marie. So first off, thanks for having me. So Gemini is really Google's answer to chat GPT. Uh, CEO Sundar Pichai says Gemini is the most advanced AI chatbot on the market, even more powerful than chat GPT, which is a bold claim. Uh, but last week, Google announced all of its AI products would fall under this new Gemini umbrella. This is really Google's attempt at a more unified push into the AI, AI space. And like you mentioned, yes, there was a complicated kind of rollout of this in December. They promised a little bit more than they really could. Mm -hmm. But now that we're actually getting our hands on this, it's really impressive. Um, and mind you, ChatGPT released nearly a year ago. And 2023 will go down as the year that Google was caught completely flat-footed on AI. But now that they're getting their hands in the game, we're really impressed. And when Google does something like this, it's an earthquake. It's big news. So you said you're really impressed. So tell me what you're seeing. I sort of like downloaded the app early this morning and I, I see how it has like an assistant option, but then like an option for a friend. I think her name's Jenny, the one that I chose anyways, where you could just have kind of a general conversation about your life with her. Um, but tell me what impressed you the most. Yeah, you know, I think that with Gemini, I think people are really shocked by how human-like some of these AI chatbots are becoming. Um, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania described his experience using Gemini like interacting with a ghost. Mm. Um, now, before you dismiss him as crazy, I mean, let's talk about what a ghost is. I mean... Uh, so, <laughs> these are little things. I don't know if he's going to say it, but see down here at the bottom, rebrands AI chatbot Bard. Remember last year, we talked about the Bard bot a lot. They rebranded this already to catch up to GPT. Or GPT. To Gemini. Gemini. And it's funny because you see this little stuff at the bottom that gives you more information on context of what's going on. But they don't really talk about it all the time. And it'd be nice sometimes to hear it actually come through their mouth and say it. But we already went over that. so It's something that feels like a human even though you know there's not a human there. That's exactly what people are coming to terms with with these advanced AI chatbots. Um, they're able to you know, identify human emotions. They're able to reason with you, explain difficult concepts. And I think that's what's most impressive to me is just the fact that they're fooling people into really thinking like, there could be a human on the other side of this. But now there are like multiple options when it comes to like assistance. I mean, in my head, at home, especially, I got to go through like a list of names. I'm like, am I talking to Siri? Am I talking to Alexa? Am I talking to Google? Gemini? Who am I talking to with all the different devices? Um, I guess I'm trying to ask, like, how does this, does this replace some of these other devices? Does it com compete with them like a Siri? So, yeah, you know, it's a great question. I mean, so very soon folks with Android phones will simply have Gemini as their phone's new digital assistant. You can download the Gemini app, long press your phone side button, and call up Gemini instead of Google Assistant. It'll be like an AI-enabled Siri, an AI Google Assistant, mm. and it's going to be a lot smarter. I think people are really going to like this. Um, but if you don't have an Android phone, you can also use Gemini in the Google app. And I also, I would just say to watch out for that twinkly Gemini logo anywhere you use Google products. I mean, this is going to be available in a lot of Google's products moving forward in the next year. All right. So one thing they didn't cover in that, which um, in the in, in the event, they didn't talk about how you needed to download the app to use it, especially for the new Samsung phones and stuff. They did not talk about at all how you needed an app to be able to use Gemini. Gemini is just supposed to be pre-built into the phone and just do it. And right now, I would say Gemini is beating Siri because Apple has not created that release for Siri yet. It has not incorporated incorporated their new AI into Siri to be able to compete with Samsung and things like that. That's why I said that they're leagues away Somehow Siri ended up hearing my me call for her, even though she's turned off and I don't have my headphones on. 
my AirPods on. Uh, that's a little bit scary. She probably heard me talking shit and didn't like it. But it, it's not intentionally. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. It's not intentional. I'm just talking about what's going on now in the world that we are in. And that just, it just seems like it's going to be beating it um, from now on. And nothing is going to really top it. One thing that definitely, and I'm always going to be, definitely going to be curious on how stuff's going to change, but we're definitely going to see a new leap on, a leap for our assistance. And this is going to go beyond just our cell phones. Like our cell phone assistance, we're going to see the, the leap. I remember when Siri first came out and it was like one of the coolest things ever. This is like, AI systems like the new Alexa and all that stuff. This is like 2.0 version. Alexa needs a version of this. Siri needs a version of this. Google Alphabet. She heard me again somehow. Google and Alphabet already are have a version of this, which is Gemini right now. Um, Chat GPTs already has apps out there so people can use it. But another version of it is going to be when... Uh, Microsoft's phones that they release, they're probably going to use some version of this as well, too. And now that we're speaking of Apple, <laughs> I mean, Microsoft, they created an ad on the Super Bowl. And it's about AI and their new co-pilot. And their co-pilot, I need to test it out and things like that. But it was actually cool to see a company come out and add their AI stuff in a Super Bowl commercials. And it's probably one of the better Super Bowl commercials. It wasn't as funny or anything, more serious. But, I mean, it's a minute long. It seemed fun. So before we watch this, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and help out the algorithm. I appreciate it very much. And let's see what Microsoft chose to do for their ad. Good morning. Watch me. Just watch me now. Just watch me now. I got some for you. A little more for you. You won't believe your eyes. Just watch me now. I got some for you. A little more for you. You won't believe your eyes. Just watch me now. Just watch me now. Yeah. Yeah, they that's it's really cool to see something like that because I, I wanted to end off the episode with something amazing and something that's really great and awesome. And especially based off of all the news that we recently got and whatnot, but this was just amazing. And being able to just see them come out with their own forms of, I don't even need any of this stuff anymore. Oh, there's another, next next weekend episode is going to be, there's some controversy that came out recently. Next week's episode is going to be some good stuff. I promise y'all. But that that commercial was dope. It Like being able to, it, it's trying to take, one thing that we should worry about is it taking positions and jobs away. Assistance might not be useful anymore. If you got an assistant, you might not need them anymore because this is going to be taken from another aspect. And it's crazy to see. It's um it's really it's really crazy to see how much changes have come to the world and life as we know it today. This podcast is to learn about what's changing our world and what's shaping our world and this is really something, this whole AI stuff is going to help us with all our productivity. It's going to help us be more creative. If it's used the way it's supposed to be used, 
with the tools necessary to our disposal, everything should go fine. And I honestly do believe that. I, I really believe there will be a lot more technological advancements. Technology already grows fast as we know it today. And it's just going to continue to grow more. And Copilot and using something like Copilot, mind you, this is not sponsored at all. It's a quick little fun ad that I saw. It was amazing. Um, and the only thing that sucks is having to test out all the apps for these things. That just gave me a new idea. That gave me a new idea. Uh, of testing all the AI apps. Like Gemini has an app, ChatGPT has an app, Copilot has an app. Uh, what, I, what other things am I missing right now? Those are the three main ones right now, I think. And I'm going to try to look and see if I can make a video to compare all three of them uh, with the same prompt and see what differences come from each one. Because I am really impressed. I can't say that enough. Um, I'm impressed. If it can do what I want it to do for certain stuff, I'm telling you I will be extremely impressed. But without further ado, thank you all for tuning into this week's episode. I appreciate it so much. It's so greatly. You don't understand how much I appreciate it. Next week, we're going to have way more talks on a bunch of stuff. So don't worry. This is just one extra week going on top of stuff. I hope you guys enjoyed your week. You guys stay safe. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Drop your hot takes in the comments if you have any hot takes. I had a few in this episode probably, and as you guys may tell. But thank you all. It's really appreciative and stuff. See you all on the upside, and peace.